Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine McClellan Kelly, Leadership Program Manager at the Dallas Regional Chamber. Welcome to another virtual town hall series confronting COVID-19 be a standout candidate in a crowded market with Will Reed, presented by the DRC and the DRC Young Professionals. Thank you for spending your noon hour with us. Many of you have joined our previous town halls with Senator Corrin, the Texas Workforce Commission, Littler, Edelman, or more. And if this is your first time, welcome. About six weeks ago, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, our team quickly reorganized to serve our members and businesses of all sizes through the Dallas region. This virtual town hall series is just one component of our robust communications efforts. We hope that you'll visit our website, dallaschamber.org, to explore news resources in a special section devo devoted to small business resources. As you might have seen, our new spokesperson, NFL Hall of Famer Emmett Smith sharing the resources on stayuptodallas.com, which is focused on connecting displaced workers to jobs. In the Dallas Regional Chamber Young Professionals, we have been focused on sharpening the tools that young professionals need to stand out and lead during, current, during the current climate, whether they're displaced or not. And we are excited to continue sharpening those tools today with Will Reed. Today, we'll be focused on how to stand out in a crowded job market. Delve deep into, the, into how to make yourself shine in your resume, LinkedIn, and during your interview, we are honored to welcome our friends from Will Reed, Megan McClay and Hagen Lane. Thank you for being here. Um, Will Reed is a recruiting firm that partners with innovative tech companies and VC-backed startups to scale sales, sales organizations and actualize growth stack strategy. While recruiting top talent is our normal strategy, during this time, they have used their particular skills to help displaced workers make their resume shine in a crowded field. We are excited to have them, have them and their tips and tricks to help you shine. So let's talk about today's format. Megan and Hagen will share their tips and tricks for how to stand out, then we'll open up the conversation for questions from you, and I will moderate that conversation. You will have the option to use the Q&A tool um, that's in WebEx, to submit your questions for the panelists, and we'll make sure everything is wrapped up um, on a timely manner. So Megan and Hagen, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. We are so excited to be with you virtually today. Like Catherine said, my name is Megan Mulcahy, and I have my colleague Hagen over here. You can see her too. Yes, our names rhyme, and yes, that's super fun. We both work for a startup talent advisory firm here in Dallas called Will Reed, and I'm gonna give you a little more information about that in a little bit. I wanted to jump in by telling you guys why we're even doing this. So we know that COVID-19 has affected a lot of the world's physical health, but also a lot of careers and job security, and we are definitely not qualified to speak about anything health regarding COVID-19. However, we are somewhat of experts as far as landing a job goes or just the idea of always being a top candidate in a marketplace, whether you're looking for a job or not. So today, Hagen and I wanna walk you guys through some steps that can really help you be a standout candidate in this season. It's interesting, we talk about this a lot, but before this global pandemic, never thought I would be saying this, we always told our clients and our hiring managers that it is a candidate's market. The candidates have all the power, the US economy was totally flooded with open jobs, open positions. The candidates could like truly pick and choose the jobs that they were interested in because there were just a lot of options. We don't know if this will remain true when the market bounces back, but due to COVID-19, the power is having a little bit of a shift. So as more and more people are losing their jobs and filing for unemployment, the employers once again are gaining back a lot of the power. I'm not saying that to say that employers are the worst. Obviously, a lot of us are employers. I'm just telling you guys because that's a really important data point for you. If you're on the job hunt and you're on the job search, it's good to know that a lot of the burden is going to fall on you to really sell yourself and stand out from a lot of the other people that are also looking for a job right now. So that said, let us jump in today. Okay. So to give you a quick overview of what we're gonna cover in our webinar, we're first gonna give you a little bit of background on why we think we can even talk to you about this. Obviously, you wanna know that we are somewhat qualified for what we're talking about. 
And secondly, we're going to take you through a very simple three-step process to become that standout candidate in a crowded market. And finally, like Catherine said, we're going to end the Q&A so that you guys can really jump in and ask any questions that we might have missed or maybe are a little bit more tailored to you. All right, so let's meet the team. Obviously, this is just a portion of the Will Reed team, but like I said, my name is Megan Mulcahy. I started with Will Reed in 2016 alongside our founder. And though I am currently our marketing director and our creative director, I am in charge of the brand, the marketing strategy. I made this deck that you're looking at right here. I did work as a recruiter for two years before stepping into this role. So I actually started in a recruiting role. I was the only recruiter at the time, and I was responsible for building our Dallas market of candidates completely from scratch. My main clients were App Dynamics and Qualtrics, and I got the opportunity to really help build those Dallas offices, and it was so much fun. Because of that, I have looked at a lot of LinkedIn profiles, a lot of resumes, I've spoken to thousands of candidates all across the U.S. that are both actively looking and passively looking. And so I have a strong passion. You can ask anyone about this, even in my personal life. I have a strong passion for making sure your LinkedIn looks fabulous. That's why I'm going to talk to you about that today. And I'm going to let Hagen talk a little bit about her background. Hi, my name is Hagen, of course. I am a senior talent advisor at Will Reed. I have spent my entire career in recruiting of various industries. I actually started out in the agency world, working in a very fast-paced environment on new positions every day. And then I moved over to Fossil Group, where I got to really be, um, really understand the specific company's needs and be a part of a candidate's experience. I have experience working on positions ranging from forklift drivers and engineers to photographers and designers. My days are filled with reviewing millions of resumes and talking to uh, many candidates on the phone. At the end of the day, I just love being able to find someone's dream job. So Megan's actually going to dig into what Will Reed really is. Yes. So introducing us, Will Reed. So like I said before, we're a talent advisory firm. We're located in Dallas. We were founded by our CEO, Paige Robinson, in 2015. When I say talent advisory firm, I feel like that's a little bit vague sounding, but the reason is because we do a lot of different things. So really simply put, we are helping startup founders hire really early sales talent so that they can start selling their product and putting it out to the world. We actually got our start with some of the best tech companies on the scene. Our CEO always says, we caught lightning in a bottle, which I love because that's so true. We have had at the beginning some of the best clients out there, MongoDB, Qualtrics, App Dynamics, they're some of our dear friends. And if you know a lot about the tech scene, you're probably thinking, that is awesome. If you don't know about the tech scene, you're probably like, whoa, those sound awesome. But what I can tell you is all of three of those actually IPO'd or were acquired in the billion. So we definitely got our start with some really, really cool companies. And since then, we are doing a lot more than just hiring and recruiting. We are very hands-on. We become a part of the company's culture. We tell them when they need to hire, how they should pay these people, what these people should be like, how to get them ramped. It's a full-on, hands-on approach to really making sure that a talent organization is up to speed. All that to say, the advice that we're going give to give you today, we're going to keep it really general. I just want you guys to know that it's going to come from the perspective of the tech sales industry, but we tried to make it applicable to everyone. I'm just telling you that because if you feel like something maybe doesn't apply to you or to your industry, please ask us a question in the Q&A because we want to make sure that we are able to answer what might be more applicable to you. Okay, so let's do this three-step approach. I feel a little bit like an infomercial. First step to becoming a standout candidate in this job market is let's make over your LinkedIn profile. Yesterday when Hagen and I were practicing this, I told her I was going to make a move that bus reference, like stream home makeover. Probably not the best joke, but I made it anyway. <laughs> a lot of candidates don't really understand the importance of a digital footprint, but if you've ever been in the recruiter seat or the hiring manager seat, you definitely know that Googling someone or finding out what someone's digital presence is like is really important and something that a lot of us do. So the whole point of making over the LinkedIn profile is to make sure that you're putting something out there that you can really be proud of. So before we even get into the practical tips, I'm going to create a step zero for some of you guys. 
go make a LinkedIn profile. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, it is just extremely beneficial, whether you're looking for a job or not. Having a LinkedIn profile isn't going to hurt your professional footprint on the internet. It can only help it. Notice I'm strictly speaking about having a LinkedIn profile. What you put on your LinkedIn profile could hurt your chances, but I'm going to cover that later. Just having one can be helpful no matter what industry you're in. And that's because top candidates are present on LinkedIn, whether they're using it daily or not. So even if you're in an industry that maybe LinkedIn isn't as useful, it is something that you can use when you meet your neighbor across the street to see what job they do. Or maybe one day you do take an industry shift and you're in a completely new industry. Because you had a LinkedIn profile, someone can look up and see what your skills are that you're bringing to the table. And then I just say this to prove to people really that LinkedIn is awesome, but of the people using the platform monthly, up to 40% access it daily. And I can say definitely for our industry, that is really, really true. We're using LinkedIn all the time for everything, and I'm sure there's a lot of other industries that are in that same boat. So why is a clean LinkedIn profile so important? I use this example, but it's not the best quarantine example, so I'm going to preface with that. Why do you brush your hair every day when you're not in quarantine? Because <laughs> when you go into work, you want to have that extra professionalism and polish that really shows that you care and gives you credibility when you're talking to someone. If you are looking better and you're bringing a professional appearance to a conversation, to a meeting, someone is going to have more of an inkling to trust you more and to give you that credibility that you do have. So are you required by your employer to brush your hair to walk into the office? No, you are not, but should you? Yeah, for sure. Same thing goes for LinkedIn. Are you required to have a LinkedIn to be a professional in the workplace? No, you are not, but I do highly recommend it because it gives you that extra credibility and that extra professionalism out there. Then secondly, another reason why it's important is hiring managers and recruiters, and I can speak because Hagen and I are both in this boat, we only spend five to 10 seconds on a profile before we decide to go to the next one or to exit. And so you have to make sure you're not giving anyone any reason to pause on your LinkedIn profile and wonder what happened here. So we really wanna have a LinkedIn that, that stands out from the crowd. Reference back to our title. So a really quick q and I'm jumping the gun, I'm asking my own Q&A here. Should I have a LinkedIn profile? My industry doesn't use LinkedIn. My answer to that is why not? Like I said, brush your hair every day, have a LinkedIn profile. Totally the same thing. <laughs> okay, and finally, I wanted to show you, share with you guys just a little bit of our methodology so that when I get into like the practical tips, it makes a little more sense of why I'm telling you to do these things. This is obviously from our own opinions, but I think it's useful for you guys when you hear our practical tips. So one, we say this to everyone, LinkedIn is truly a marketing page. So while remaining honest, everything on your LinkedIn profile should only be beneficial to you and only help you. So for example, a resume is going to be where you put all of the details. That might not be sometimes as glamorous, like the dates that you worked at a job at a company that let you go. You are not lying by not including the specific dates by, on your LinkedIn. You need to put those on your resume so that the people can know. But Leaving them off your LinkedIn gives them no reason to pause when they're scrolling through your LinkedIn profile. And it allows you to speak over the phone to that situation, give specific details. And I'll get more into that later, but the thing to remember is everything on your LinkedIn should only help you. It's your marketing page. Two, LinkedIn has very limited real estate, or it should. Top candidates allocate that real estate correctly with relevant information. So the example I like to give for this is, a senior partner at a management consulting company probably doesn't list that they worked at the Marble Slab part-time when she was in high school. I can say this because I did work at the Marble Slab part-time. I am extremely proud of myself. However, you will not find it on my LinkedIn because it's not super helpful as a marketing director at a startup. So make sure that everything on your LinkedIn is telling a cohesive story about who you are and what your story is. In summary, your LinkedIn should only up your chances of getting a job and it should always be succinct and organized. That said, let's get practical, y'all. Here's some practical tips. Get out your notepad, open up your LinkedIn. We're gonna get into the, the dirty details of what you can do to clean it up. So at the end of this, we can make the move that bus reference. Okay, your headline. 
that is under your profile picture. So the short little, I don't know how many characters it is, but there's some form of subtext underneath your profile picture. That's called your headline. What we recommend for this is use an industry-wide job title. So something that when you tell someone else in your industry, I am a blah, 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 they'll be like, yes, that makes a lot of sense. If you make it a little too vague or confusing, people will be less inclined to stay on your profile, whether they're your customer or a future employer. Secondly, I would recommend including your company name. It just allows someone to quickly digest where you work and what you do when they open your page, instead of having to scroll down to the bottom. So for example, on, on my profile right now, my headline is marketing director at Will Read, rather than just marketing director. Third point, and this one is totally up to you, it's more of a recommendation, but if you are currently unemployed or you're between jobs, we recommend putting your previous job title. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm not a liar, you are not a liar, and I promise you that is not the case, what I would say is you are what your job is. So regardless if I work at Will Read or not, I still am a marketing director and I'd like to continue to be a marketing director. So in order to showcase that to my future employer, I'm gonna tell them quickly what my job is I'm not gonna put marketing director at Will Read because obviously I would no longer work at Will Read in this scenario. I would just put marketing director so that they know what I'm doing. And as shallow as this might seem, putting something like looking for my next adventure or seeking something new, it just gives you less of a chance to tell your story. So we want, that, we want you to be able to share that story over the phone. Maybe you took a sabbatical, maybe you got laid off, all of these things that aren't necessarily your fault or a bad thing, but don't give them a reason to think that. Give them the opportunity to talk to you on the phone and you can tell the compelling story of why you are unemployed right now. And finally, avoid any symbols or bizarre titles. This is obviously up to you. This is a recommendation. I would just say sometimes it can take away from your professionalism on LinkedIn to have a bunch of emojis in your title or something that's a little confusing. We definitely have some good laughs sometimes of what people choose to put in their headlines. So I would just say, always be really conscious that you're presenting the brand that you want to be presenting. And oftentimes you're gonna take a more professional approach and allow someone to get to know you professionally before you get super, super personal. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the LinkedIn summary. So this is the paragraphs that go underneath the picture and the headline. This is the little, section that some people have and some people don't. The reason that some people have it and some people don't is if you don't put anything in it, it just doesn't show up. My methodology for this is personal to me, I would say, but I would say if you're gonna do it, do it right, but you don't have to do it. So don't feel like having a summary is a requirement for a good LinkedIn profile. It's definitely not, but if you'd like to have one, it needs to be really good. So I would say, make sure to keep it really, really clean. It needs to have no grammar, no typos, and make sure it's tailored to you and your personality. So I always say, I would prefer it not to be written in the third person. Occasionally I'll come across some that, for example, if it was mine, Megan is a go-getter and she loves to design slides. And I do a lot more than that, but that's an example. I would say it feels a little more robotic when it's written like that. So I would write it in the first person, make it personal, well-written. The bottom line of your summary is that it should provide value that your, the rest of your LinkedIn isn't providing. So anything that's on the bottom should be adding. Okay, on to the next experience section. So your experience on LinkedIn is the bulk of what you think of when you see a LinkedIn profile. It's the job, it's the company logo, that's what's going on there. So whenever you start to fill this out, I would say your methodology should be get, get everything on there and then we're gonna clean it up as we go. So it's similar to your resume, start listing where you've worked, link it to the company logos, and then we're gonna start putting in actual words. Our methodology for this is quantify everything you can. And we're gonna talk about this on the resume too, but reason being, whenever you can get numbers on a profile, it is so much easier for someone who's evaluating you to digest and to see 
to benchmark you against others. And so if you have really impressive stats to put on your profile, it looks really, really good. So quantify wherever you can, even if you're not in a sales role and you're in, for example, a marketing role, X new followers in X amount of time. That's impressive. If you are in a job that literally has no relation to numbers, I'm thinking teachers, they, they do a lot with numbers, but if their job is harder to quantify, you can say, let a group of X number of students it's quantifying some way, and that's basically what I'm trying to say. So if your class was this size, list that. So that really people can be like, wow, that was a big class, or anything that just gives them a data point of kind of how they should base their reaction. Okay, secondly, use a consistent format on your LinkedIn profile. So make sure that whatever you choose to do, whether it be bullet points or dashes or full sentences or phrases, it needs to be the same the whole time. So when I look at your experience section, Every job should have the same format. So what I always like to recommend, people are like, what format? I always like to recommend do one sentence about, one to two sentences about your company, and then include two to three bullet points underneath that about what your job was and those quantities that are impressive. So awards or folders or anything like that underneath in those bullet points. So like I said, one to two sentences about the company and then two to three bullet points. And that's the same for every single experience. Don't do sentences for one and bullet points for another, and sentences for one, bullet points for another. Do the same thing on all of them. And then finally, make sure that logos appear. This sounds very trivial, and it is a little bit, but it just looks so much cleaner when you have the LinkedIn official logo being pulled in from that company page. And then I can also tell you, as a recruiter, when I was looking at profiles, I was scrolling through so many profiles, but if I saw they worked at a company I hadn't heard of, I would open that company and I would say, okay, how big is this company? Would it translate well to the job I'm working on? And I would look into the company. If it's not linked, the recruiter can't do that. So make sure it's linked, it looks cleaner, and it just helps your chances of being better qualified before you get into that phone interview. Okay, finally, on the experience, I have one one, so we've got two slides here. If your average tenures are less than two years, first of all, that is okay. But secondly, we do recommend changing it to the year format instead of months. It just looks cleaner on your profile. It gives employers less of a reason to pause because what are they doing when they look at your profile? They're saying, do I want this person to work for me? So let's do years instead of months on your profile and then speak to whatever your experience is over the phone. Tell your story that way. If your company was acquired or dissolved, be sure to note that somewhere on the profile just to make it clear why you were at that company for a short period of time. So occasionally we'll have candidates that work at a company for three months and then that company gets acquired by a really large company. And on their profile, it looks like they were only at their job for three months and then they left. And as an employer, you're thinking, oh my goodness, what happened there? Well, instead of giving them that pause, you can write what's acquired by XYZ company, and then they'll be able to see, oh, they just got acquired, and that's why the logo changed. And then finally, I already talked about this, but just to reemphasize, I would remove any internships or college jobs unless they're extremely relevant or impressive to your career. Otherwise, it's just taking up that really needed real estate on your LinkedIn profile. Okay, so on to the education section. So, the GPA should really only be included on your profile if it is stellar. So I would say, this is always a tough question, but I would say it's just these days, GPA, especially the farther you get out from school, we don't really need to know it. Even, even when I was recruiting, I wasn't often looking at that. So having it on there, only put it on there if it's like really, really amazing. Otherwise, they're not even going to think about it. So I would just leave it off. It's not worth the conversation piece. You don't really need it. Secondly, if you have a gap between school and your career, totally okay. But I would recommend removing your grad years on your education section of your LinkedIn profile just to, once again, not give them reason to pause and think, what, what were they doing? So if you have that gap, just remove your graduation years on your LinkedIn profile. Also, make sure that your education only appears once. This is something that we talk about pretty frequently because for some reason, I don't know why, but a lot of people have their education on their profile twice. So if you've got it on there twice, go ahead and remove one of those because you only need it once. And then finally, this is kind of just like a pro tip for you. If you paid your way through school, 
all power to you. That is amazing. Make sure you show that off. Put it on your profile. Put it in the description section. Education 100% funded through XYZ scholarship or through working full time at blah, blah, blah. That's just a really cool tip and definitely worth including. Okay, finally, I call these the bonus sections, but this is not the official title for these sections. So if you try to use that vernacular, someone might laugh at you. Hopefully you're not laughing at me, but I'll never know because this is a webinar. The bonus sections are like the volunteer section, the skills and endorsement, the group. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like the sections that you kind of look at, but not really. So the volunteer work, great. I love it. I'm not going to go look for it first when I'm looking at someone's profile, but I do get a warm heart when I see that you're helping the puppies on the weekend. So go ahead, put it on there. Love it. You can talk about it on the phone. Gives you a, a way to relate to someone if maybe they do something similar. Great. Skills and endorsements. I'm about to burst some people's bubbles here, so I'm just apologies in advance. They really just don't mean a ton. I'm not going to lie. Every single time I open LinkedIn and it's like my cousin, should I endorse them for PowerPoint? I'm like, absolutely. Jason, I bet he's awesome at PowerPoint. I'm endorsing him. So I'm assuming that a lot of us do something similar. We're just endorsing people left and right. Now, devil's advocate to myself, you definitely can add those to your profile that recruiters like myself can search for specific skills. So for example, if you are proficient in Adobe Suite and you want an employer to know that, go ahead and add it to your profile. They're probably not going to look to see if Grandma Carol endorsed you for Adobe Suite, but they are now aware that you know how to use the Adobe Suite. So there are some pros there, but I'll say, how many endorsements do you have? And uh, I don't know if that's super important. <laughs> the groups that are on your profile, once again, I wasn't looking for those actively as a recruiter, but I will say like, it is kind of cool to see that people like went a couple steps ahead and joined groups that were relevant to their company, to their job, to their industry. So go ahead and join some. I personally haven't found a ton of benefit from using them, but I also haven't put a lot in. So maybe it's one of those things where you get in what you put, you get out what you put in, and I haven't put anything in. So if someone else has had a great experience with groups, let me know. Following companies, I'm just gonna put that in the same bucket as the groups. Follow the ones that are relevant to your role. I follow all of our clients. It helps me stay relevant on what they're doing. I scroll through, see what's up with them. That's just a great thing to keep you in the loop. It looks good, makes you look aware. And then finally, I recommend, even if you're like not sure if you want a job search, you can turn on open to new opportunities, which is a feature on LinkedIn, whether you're actively or passively looking. It is only able to be seen if someone has LinkedIn Recruiter, which is a special version of LinkedIn they can purchase. It's expensive too, so not a lot of people have it, but people in recruiter seats typically have LinkedIn Recruiter and they can see if someone's open to new opportunities. People at your current company, even if they have LinkedIn Recruiter, cannot see that you have this turned on. Caveat, is technology always foolproof? No. So just be aware of that. Are you telling your employer, I'm definitely leaving my job by turning this on? No, you're just open. But I would say just, just be smart about it. I don't know who can see it. It is a really good function. I will say as recruiters, we use it a lot to reach out to people who we know are a little bit more active. So just just something to keep in mind. Okay, and then to kind of wrap this up, professionalism and polish just over on LinkedIn, I'd say don't have typos, grammar errors, or spelling errors. I mean, that is the biggest like red flag to me personally when I was looking at profiles. Like I said, this is your marketing page. If the person didn't take the time to spell graduation right on their profile, I'm like, oh my word, what emails are they sending to their customers? So just something to keep in mind, make sure that the spelling is right, the grammar is right, Secondly, your headshot. I'm not going to go super deep with this. If you're interested, there is a blog on the Will Read blog called The Worst LinkedIn Profile Pictures We've Ever Seen. And I did model for all of them. I think it's pretty hilarious, but it is really important to remember that as we're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but you personally are making that cover and putting it out to the world. So make sure whatever you're putting on the book's cover is what you want to be saying to the world. I'm professional, this isn't a blurry photo, this isn't a photo of me summiting a mountain, which is awesome, but not super relevant to LinkedIn. So if you wanna like check to see if your LinkedIn profile picture is in the clear, go look at that blog, it might be helpful. 
the cover photo, I never stress about this. I just make, say make sure it's professional and not blurry. You can even use the default one and I probably would have never noticed otherwise. And then finally, a lot of people might not know this, but on LinkedIn, if you reach 500 connections, it stops counting your connections to the rest of the world. So if you have 417 connections, your LinkedIn says you have 417 connections. If you have 517 connections, it says you have 500 plus. So if you get to 500 plus, it just makes you look like an active user of the platform and well networked. So I just recommend getting to 500. Don't just go at everyone willy nilly, but Grandma Car Carol and Cousin Jason, go ahead, add them. They can endorse you if you're lucky. Okay, to sum up this section really quickly, I already touched on all these, but just as a summary, red flags are less than 500 connections, um, professional photo, no education listed. Even if you haven't completed a bachelor's degree or any form of college education, that's okay. List any form of advanced learning that you've done, whether that's a class you took or high school, anything like that. Messy formatting is a red flag, typos, unprofessional writing, short tenures or job hops. We talked about how to get around that and gaps in work experiences. But on a positive note, here are some bonus points. A professional headshot, some really strong recommendations, I will say that I personally did read the recommendations. I thought it was cool to see what your peers or someone you reported to or someone that reported to you was saying about you. So this can be good to get. Clean formatting, interest group, an impressive alma mater, an impressive college experience or community involvement, any metrics or awards, a relevant degree or field of study, and then an imp a professional about section, which is your summary. Okay. I am out of breath here. I've been talking a ton, so I'm gonna pass it off to Hagen to talk about the resume. Perfect, let's dive into the resume. This is gonna be a little bit quicker, just because honestly, we're seeing a lot in the tech sales industry that resumes are not being um, used as much, and really the focus is on LinkedIn profiles. However, um, that's not the case in all industries, and it is important to always have a strong resume in your back pocket. I think at the end of the day, all the managers that I've ever worked with still like to have a resume in front of them when it comes down, when it comes time to actually interview a candidate. So let's make sure your resume stands out from the crowd. So kind of going over our resume uh, methodology, I'd like to go over that, um, how Will Reed sees it. Um, LinkedIn is viewed as your marketing page, as Megan said. Um, everything on LinkedIn should only help you as a candidate. Resumes are everything you find on LinkedIn, plus all the details hiring managers would want slash need to know when it comes down to um, hiring you. This would include performance metrics, employment dates, GPA, if, it's a, if you're a recent graduate, um, and job, more details of your job responsibilities. Resumes are truly your source of truth and should be um, there should be very few service level questions at the end of the day once you go through it. Um, make sure what the great thing about resumes is you're only sharing it with people who ask for it. So this is going to be really part of what you're looking for in your next career and really just sealing the deal when it comes down to your interview. So now we're going to dig into more practice resume, practical resume tips. So first off, when it comes to your resume, tailor it for your industry. An accountant is not gonna have the same re resume as a interior designer. Um, and don't feel like it has to be. Make it personalized and personalized for you, yourself and your who you are and also the job that you're going for. Have an organizational method to keep like items together and in a chronological order, making sure that the most recent role is at the top. It's very, it's very confusing seeing so many resumes that always have your most recent role at the top and then suddenly seeing a resume as at the bottom. So just kind of go with the crowd on this one and keep it in that order. Make sure you're highlighting that career progression. There's nothing more exciting for a recruiter and a manager to see um, someone get those promotions and see that drive. And so make sure that's really highlighted on, on your resume and easy to tell. Make sure you're um, keep everything to one page. I know this can be so difficult, but trust me, I don't want to go through eight pages of a resume, and it's just really helpful. If it's all on one page. I know some people are, are going to say, I can't fit it to all one page. There are things that you can cut, um, and also making sure that you're not excessively adding um, things to every role. 
make sure you're using a consistent format throughout. Uh, as Megan touched on with LinkedIn, just making it all look clean and professional is the goal here. With that, using bullet points is really helpful, um, kind of just keeping it as organized as possible and for managers and recruiters to be able to skim through it quickly. Now we're gonna dive into more of the content. Um, making sure your, con your contact inf information is present and professional. You do not have to put your full address or anything, putting your city is perfect. Um, and making sure that your email is professional as well, that it's just your name at gmail.com or something like that. Also, nowadays, just include your LinkedIn URL. Most managers and recruiters are looking for it anyways, so you might as well make it easy for them. I did get to, like I said before, get to work in the design industry before, and so making sure if you are in that design world, including a portfolio is really beneficial and something that managers are gonna wanna see from the get-go anyways. Managers are gonna be looking for your education, so try to keep that, like, like Megan said, only once on your resume, but either all together at the top or all together at the bottom. Of course, this doesn't have to mean that you went to college. This could be even high school or any certifications or extra studies you did, like an Excel certification, an HR certification. Those are awesome added bonuses, especially during if you have some downtime right now that you could be working on and adding that to your resume, it just shows that you have some drive. Like Megan also touched on, GPA, a little up in the air. Um, I kind of play it by if you are a recent graduate and if it's at least over 3.5, after your second job out of college, just drop it, don't worry about it. Some people will ask about objectives at the top. These are not necessary. If you need to take up some real estate space on your resume, go ahead and add it. But I do like to make sure that your objective coincides with the job you're interviewing for. This is not lying. If you switch it up for every job that you apply for, it just shows that you made some effort. You're not mass applying to a million positions that you really edited your resume for the role that you're applying for and that you are passionate about the role that you're applying for. If you have two jobs outside of college, um, go ahead, like Megan referred to earlier, re uh, remove those internships and those college roles or high school roles unless they're really relevant for the job that you're applying for. A little more on that, um, making sure that you quantify accomplishments. Megan obviously touched on this, but also I think it could coincide with just including any um, awards that you received even. Um, top recruiter, top HR manager. Um, this Not everyone works in an industry where it's all about numbers, and so, We'd love to see those awards that you received or just those call outs that you received from your manager just to show that you are passionate about your job and, and you're good at your job. This is the time to brag. Um, again, highlighting that career progression and using keywords. I know in recruiting space, we're always trying to weed out um, resumes. And so we are searching for those keywords. So say you're a manager, I'd love to see the words develop and using those little buzzwords to help me realize that what you did in more detail um, using just accomplished and different goals and different projects that you achieved and everything, that's always great to see as well. Okay, finally, triple check your grammar and spelling. This is huge. Again, if I just see a misspelled word, it doesn't feel like you put a lot of time or effort into your resume and I just kind of move on to the next one. Don't be afraid just to go online and if you don't have someone to proofread at home, go to Grammarly.com, it's a free service. It's really great and they can kind of comb through your resume. It may not catch everything, but it will help out a lot. Don't be afraid to use those online sources. Remain humble, catch 22. Again, like I said, brag about yourself. I wanna know why you're a rock star and why I should reach out to you and have that phone interview with you. But also, I don't wanna see 18 bullet points under each position, keeping it to one page. I wanna hear about your accomplishments, but I don't wanna go into your day-to-day -day on your resume. So finding that great balance is really the key. Kind of last little tidbit, don't be afraid to use an online template. I know it probably seems like you shouldn't, but it's a great jumping off point, especially if you're not really sure about your resume. Maybe edit a few things here and there so it doesn't seem like a complete copy and paste, but it definitely helps out and gives you a little bit more confidence to present that in front of a, um, a manager. Going in to kind of overview, um, just some of those red flags. Again, I don't wanna see multiple pages. Trust me, seeing the 12 page resumes 
it's a lot. Um, so try to keep it to one page. Text heavy, um, please don't go under 10 point font. I know that's hard too, if you wanna include a lot of details, but just give me the overview. Any typos or unprofessional writing is what we're trying to stay away from. And then of course, I do wanna see that success that you've had and, and making sure you're highlighting that. Bonus points is including those metrics, those numbers, anything, goals you've hit, awards you've won, um, and just making sure that it's clean and professional. Like we kind of again and again, we're wanting to make sure we can re review this resume or your LinkedIn profile quickly and see that you're a rock star easily. Now, Megan is gonna help us prep for the big day in the interview. Awesome. So prepping for the interview arguably can be even more important than the actual interview itself. So just some tips before you even go into the interview. This is something that we always offer as a pro tip that some people think might be a little weird, but actually is something that can go a really long way. Connect with your interviewer on LinkedIn before your interview. It allows them to put a face with a name. It shows them that you're being proactive, looking at their background. And that for me always went a really long way to show that someone was thinking, oh, I do have my interview today. I'm gonna to look into their background or the day before or whatever. So just something to do. Also make sure you research the company and the interviewers. I'm not talking go to the homepage and memorize the tagline of what the company does. I'm thinking look at their Twitter, see who they recently hired as an executive, see how much money they raised, things that are recent and relevant and show that you are up to date on what's going on with that company. Finally, the technology is just so important. Make sure you test the tech, especially now that we're all at home. Make sure you test the tech and make sure it's working. Select a very professional background. A white wall is a great option or just a background that's not distracting. So things that aren't inappropriate and things that aren't moving would be great. Just something simple and uh, make sure you can be heard and there's not a lot of background noise. So that's prepping for the interview, and Hagen's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the actual interview. Okay, so day of, make sure you're only arriving five minutes early. I know that can be a little stressful for some of us, but it is a little uncomfortable if you're sitting in the lobby of your, your interviewer for 30 minutes and they're trying to get things together or even get their coffee. Um, but make sure that you know where you're going um drive make the drive the day before check for traffic ask if there's any specific parking instructions especially if you're going downtown uh, there really is no excuses for being late the day of so kind of going back to my five minutes early i'm not saying that you don't have to sit in your car for 20 minutes before your interview take get there early take a breath review your notes have a sip of water and then go in five minutes before the interview make sure you bring a few printed copies of that resume that we just rocked out um, and a portfolio to carry those resumes. You never know if someone else is gonna jump into the interview or if a manager just didn't have time to print something so they can have it in front of them to review. Making sure that you dress professionally, of course, is not a bad thing to be the best dressed. If you are not sure, go ahead and just dress more on the professional side rather than more on the casual. I have worked in casual environments and no one's gonna knock you for uh, dressing in a pencil skirt or slacks or heels or whatever it may be. Go ahead and just be the best dressed in the room and you can edit from there. Try to stay away from filler words. This means like. Try to stay away from like, like, like. And of course the ums. I know I have a problem with that as well, but just work hard um, and kind of stay calm. I think that helps a lot. Make sure you're answering the questions um, fully and professionally. Really the best method for this is the STARS method. If you don't know the STARS method, again, Google it real fast. It kind of takes you through giving an answer, providing examples, inclusions, and solutions for any questions that you're given, just a full roundabout answer. Try not to ramble. Don't go on tangents or anything like that. Answer the question professionally and let them move on to their next question. Don't be afraid, again, to use your online resources. Google popular questions. Um, there's tons of different sources and review your answers. Have those examples in the back of your head. Um, just try to overly prep. I've even called friends and sent them questions to ask me. And so I can practice that way as well. Watch, make sure you're watching your body language. Don't sit there with your arms crossed and pouting on your face, but also don't be waving your hands in the air either. Kind of just stay professional and 
act like you want the job, of course, at the end of the day. At the end of the interview, always have two thoughtful questions prepared. Let's not dive into what does your PTO look like? Can I work from home? Save that for maybe the offer period um, or even asking the recruiter that you're working with on the position. Ask more questions such as, what does my day-to-day -day look like? What am I expected to know on my first day? And what are my development opportunities? Now, Megan's gonna kinda go into the follow-up. Okay, so now I'm nervous that I've been using a bunch of filler words. We'll find out later in the recording. So tips on the follow-up. We always tell people to treat the interview process like a sales process. So you're kind of like selling yourself to the employer. So you're going to qualify yourself, you're going to follow up, and you're going to close the interview. So tips on following up. We always say send a thank you note within one hour of your interview. That seems like aggressive. A lot of people say, whoa, an hour. We say that because some of our clients even think that 30 minutes is too long to wait. Just showing them that they're top of mind, you've had an hour to decompress and think about what you talked about, go ahead and send that to their email inbox one hour at the latest over to them. When I say thoughtful, I'm saying it doesn't need to be super long. It still needs to be short, quick, to the point, but not a template that you Googled off the internet. Make it something specific to the conversation that you had and really indicate your excitement for the role. Also, just a note, a handwritten thank you note goes a really long way too, so definitely feel free to do both. Send one to the email inbox, but then also drop one in the mail that day. I know whenever we get those, we're always like, oh my word, people still send snail mail. I love this. So definitely gives you some brownie points if you decide to do that. And then the last one is just a pro tip that I've always thought was super cool. We have people sometimes reach out to someone that's in a similar role for the role that they're interviewing for. And that goes a really long way at building an internal advocate for yourself within the organization. So it also helps you. You can find out more about what the job is like and if they like it and just get the inside scoop. Okay, this is my last piece of advice before our Q&A. So take this, if you hear nothing else, this is what you should hear. You do not have to be 100% sold in the interview, but you should give 100% to get the offer. Don't try to make the employer sell you on the job. First, make them really, really want to have you on the team. Make them really want to give you the offer because it gives you the power to decide. If you try to make them sell you, they have a lot more of the power as well. So get the offer, make them really, really want you. And once that you are convinced that they really, really want you on the team, you have more of the power to make the decision. So that goes for employers too. Honestly, I can tell you both sides. Both parties should be really trying to sell themselves in the interview process. That said, that wraps up what we have to give you today. So we are ready for some Q&A that Catherine's gonna lead us in. So I'm back, hi. Um, thank you all for such great content. This was really informative and I'm over here thinking about my LinkedIn profile just in general. I'm like, what am I missing? Just because I love LinkedIn and like optimizing it as well. So these are great tips, whether you're searching for your next position or just want to um, become a thought leader or just really want to be on top of your game for everything in life. Um, so thank y'all for that. So our first question is from Anne. Anne asks, um, how do you recommend accounting for a job gap on a resume um, that happened because of you were taking care of a sick family member? Great, yeah. So honestly, I'm gonna ask about the job gap anyways as a recruiter. So if you can put it, include it very professionally in between maybe um, just the star next to it, I wouldn't go into details, just acknowledging the gap. Again, everyone's gonna ask anyways, so you might as well include it to make it easy for everybody. I don't think it's bad as long as it's very professional. I don't need to go into the details of what happened or how long, but it wouldn't hurt. Thanks, Anne, for that great question. I know a lot of us, have had to take gaps for different reasons. And that's good to know that we might we don't have to go in depth on the resume, but make sure you have your answer ready for that first term of review. Um, our next question comes from Tina. What are your thoughts about writing um, what writing about what you do for a headline? I.e., I lead a dynamic team through the human centered design process or something similar. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay, I am actually a big fan of that. I think it almost cuts out all of the middle work that I'm having to do in my brain. You're just telling me right away what to do. 
once again, that's a personal preference, but I think it's so professionally written that that's great. Now I know exactly what you do. I better understand it. And if I want to know your title, I can scroll down and look at your experience section. So as long as it's professional and tells me what you do, I think that's great. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Definitely if you have kind of one of those more vague um, job titles that don't really just encompass, like if you just told someone your title, you wouldn't know exactly what they do. Um, I know for mine, my headline is community leader, public speaker, and talent builder, just because leadership program manager is very vague <laughs> and can mean a lot of different things depending on the company. So thank you for that great tip, Tina. Um, Casey asked, if I got a pay raise, but not a new title, so still promotion type, since already in a higher position, do we include that on our resume? Honestly, I would not include it on your resume unless your, your job changed at all. If you also got a team with that pay raise, I would include that. But if your role didn't really change at all, I wouldn't change anything on your resume. Thank you, Casey, for that great question. So our next question comes from Christine. Do you have any tips um, for breaking into the tech sales industry for an experienced salesperson who lacks experience on the, um, of the technology sales world? I think this could be a greater question as well for those of us who are trying to break into an industry that um, has similar roles to what we're doing, but we might not have experience in this specific industry that typically requires some type of knowledge base. How do we go about that? Yeah, that's, that's a deep question. And whoever asked that should reach out to Will Reed directly because I would, I would love to talk to you more about this in depth. I'm going to kind of like answer a little bit around it, so I apologize in advance, but I would say find someone in the industry that you're looking to switch into that also switched into that industry and ask them how they approach that. Um, for tech sales specifically, I will say like a lot of the companies that we're hiring for will have you start a little bit more at an entry level, so you have to be okay with that idea. That's not always the case. There might be times whenever they're able to take you at a more senior level. But I would say target industries that are somewhat relevant to what you've been doing. In sales, even tech sales, there is a technology in every industry as it is. So, for example, if you're a principal at an elementary school and you want to be in tech sales now, go look at the company's platform that you were using every day in your principal job and tell them you're interested in selling that platform because you've used it for 10 years. So there's always a little in like that that you can use, but I would love to talk to you more about this in depth, so feel free to reach out as well. That's my short answer. Our next question comes from Sarah. On your resume, how many bullet points are too many bullet points below your relevant job experience? The number six bullet points as possible would be great. Um, I know that's gotta be hard, but really just putting your high level highlights. Uh, trust me, I'm. As a recruiter, I'm going to see that, get excited, reach out, and then we can dive in more to your day-to-day. -day. I don't need to see the nitty-gritty of the role just on one page of your resume. That's a great question because, I like, honestly, sometimes it's hard to sum up what you do in six bullet points. But once again, you're giving them a short advertisement to get them to give you a call so that you can give into the longer deep dive. So our next question comes from Nicole. What is your suggestion if you have a phone interview and you feel like you didn't present your best or wish you had given a different answer to a question? Do you want to go ahead? I'm excited about this one because <laughs> I think that's so, that's so like uh, everyone has those situations. And so make, making sure that I've had some great thank you emails or I think in that situation, if you already know you messed up, sending a quick thank you email rather than the thank you note. The thank you note can come again after, but also highlighting the question, saying, kind of explaining more, I no harm in that. I have read those emails and appreciated that. Sometimes you just need a little more time to think, of it, think everything out and no harm, no foul with that. So I think just go ahead and sending up that follow-up email with thank you, going over your answers that you, or kind of just any tidbits that you wish you had included in that interview. Good question. Thank you, Hagen. I'm glad you got excited about that because I know sometimes those on the fly questions and you're just, you start thinking about it afterwards and you're like, oh, there's so much more I should have given in that answer. So um, that's good to know that we can email the recruiter or this interviewer afterwards and follow up with more information or a better answer if you came up with one later. So our next question comes from Mike. 
What is the best way for people to approach recruiters like yourself on LinkedIn, other than, hey, looking for a new job, what you got? <laughs> Hagan, do you want this one, sitting in the recruiter seat? <laughs> Um, that's a hard one because yeah, most of the time I don't want as a recruiter, I, I kind of want you to know what you're looking for. Um, and so maybe coming at a recruiter with, here's my skill set, here's what I'm interested in, kind of having a game plan rather than I'm not going to know what to present you if you just say, Hey, I'm in the market. What can you give me? Um, I really come in and sell yourself and highlight um, different skill sets that you have in the industries you're interested in and how you might be um, a good fit for those. And to add on to that too, I would say probably the fastest way to get on a recruiter's good side is to approach it with humility. I think probably just the worst feeling in the world is to feel like an order taker. And so to have someone be like, what you got? How are you going to help me? It just makes you feel like so less than and so I would say any way you can approach a recruiter understanding that you might not be a fit for the jobs that they're working on and that is not their fault and that is not your fault it just isn't a fit so approach it with humility and I promise you that person's going to be way more willing to help you even if it doesn't benefit them at all they might go out of their way to help you um so our next question is also from Sarah but I thought it was really interesting do you recommend sending cover letters for all job applications even if they're optional Um, I think personal preference. Some people say they don't need them. I don't think it's always needed, but it is a nice bonus point. Again, kind of like I said with objective, making sure that it definitely coincides with the job. I think if this market, like we're thinking it's going to be, it's definitely going to be a, a manager's hiring market. Um, just making you stand out, showing that you put the effort in, um, showing that you did the research on the company, um, just adding little tidbits, adding little tidbits of why you think you'd be a good fit. There's no harm in a cover letter. If I can, as long as it's very clean, I can quickly scan through it. I don't want to spend uh, 20 minutes reading a cover letter, but as long as it's quick and to the point um, and very thoughtful, I, there's no harm in it. Uh, so on to the next question, which I think is a tough one for everyone. How do you answer the question, what do you expect to earn or what is your expected salary for the position? Thank you, Christina, for this question, because I know tips are all over the place for either direction on this one. Yeah, I'm interested to see what Hagen has to say too, because totally tips all over the place too. What I subscribe to, and I will say that our industry is very unique in this sense, so this might not be applicable to all industries, but like, Honesty is the best policy. I know that sounds very elementary, but put your cards out on the table. But I would say that conversation, as much as possible, we always try to encourage compensation to be held off until later in the recruiting process. However, if you are working with a recruiter, an agency especially, that is your that is just the best way to get in the door. If you're you can always be honest with your recruiter. So tell them what you want to be making be super, super honest with them. If it's the employer, that's a little bit of a different story. And that's where the advice kind of gets hazy for me. I'm like, I don't know if you should be super upfront right off the bat. Um, but definitely, if you're working with a recruiter, tell them, just be honest with them, because they can help you get that. Do you have anything to add to that, Hagen? No, I think, yeah, like you said, being honest and in, in asking the recruiter what is expected um, for this position is a totally safe zone. I think when it comes to working with a manager, um, kind of staying humble, but also you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. So it is a catch 22. It's, um, you don't want to count yourself out and say too high. And then also you don't want to say too low and then get stuck with something you're not happy. So I think kind of presenting it as based off of my experience, based off of these accomplishments, and then presenting the number that you see fit. We do want to make sure you're excited about the number at the end of the day when you get the job, if you get the job. So um, I think honesty a little bit, but don't, don't try to overshoot it, <laughs> at least. And I think this is a good point to remember um, from the interview tips about connecting to associates in similar roles, is do your research. Reach out to people who have similar titles or work at similar companies and have an idea of what their salaries are. Um, I think there needs to be a much more candid conversation about what is everyone getting paid? <laughs> 
because that makes that question a lot less scary because then you have the market value or some idea of what the market value can be for a position, which makes you come from a more educated space to understand whether an offer is lower or higher um, once you get to that point, but even answer that simple question of what do you expect to earn from this position. Um, one more question um, from Megan. Do you think employers will be more understanding what job gaps that are related to COVID-19? And what have you, um, what do you have, do you have any recommendations on the best way to explain a layoff due to this? Yeah, well, first off, I am so sorry that happened. I know everyone's in really tough situations right now. And um, I would say, yes, absolutely. I think we were talking about this this morning before we started our webinar. We were like, this has just been such a season of grace. I feel like everyone is showing it around every corner. I think as soon as you can flip the conversation, don't dwell on that too long. That's the reality. That's what happened. It was completely out of your control. Flip the conversation and talk about what you're excited to bring to a team. Start talking about the positives. Start talking about how that was out of your control, but this is what I'm going to bring to a future team. And I think as soon as you can change it into a positive thing, that's going to be really helpful. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be too concerned. I mean, we're, we understand that better than anyone. We're talking to employers all day long and they know this is just a crazy situation. Well, thank you, Megan and Hagen, for your time. I do want to respect y'all's time for the rest of the day. Remember, if you have questions that didn't get answered, feel free to email Megan or Hagen. Their emails are still on your screen. Um, and make sure that you visit DallasChamber.org um, to check out all the resources that we have going on and any upcoming webinars that we have, as well as check checking out SayYesToDallas.com um, for our displaced job workers. If you, um, if you are looking for um, positions during this time, they have a great database that's pulling things as soon as they're um, up on Indeed to make sure that we can get those who have lost their jobs into new positions. And I hope by the end of this, I see a LinkedIn um, friend request from all of y'all because you should be optimizing your LinkedIn. Um, but if not, I will find you and hopefully we can be friends. Um, until the next time, have a great rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you.